War. War never changes. Ron Perlman says these words in the opening moments of Fallout, and they have been said at the opening of every main Fallout game since. The irony, of course, is that Fallout is always changing. From its point of view, to its writing, to even its system, the franchise has, well, mutated over the years and varied in unexpected ways. But if you know anything about the development of the game, this honestly fits. The first Fallout went through a similar evolution through its creation process, and through this evolution, it became something truly... special. Welcome to Arcadeology, the development of Fallout. Before you play a single second, before you even see the title of the game, two things come up. First is Interplay, the name of the studio that developed and published the game. The second is Brian Fargo. At the point in his career that Fallout was released, Fargo had been mostly removed from the day-to-day -day development process. However, Fargo had worked on several RPGs in the early years of his company, and one of them would influence Fallout above any other media. Early Interplay was a company focused on working with the two big third-party publishers of the early to mid-80s, Activision and Electronic Arts. One of Interplay's first big RPG successes was Bard's Tale, a fantasy RPG with dungeon crawl gameplay. Bard's Tale was noteworthy for its graphical achievements and animations. Michael Crawford was the primary designer for the game, but Brian Fargo assisted with additional level and scenario design, while Rebecca Heineman wrote the development tools for the game. Wasteland is what Brian Fargo referred to as a five-year epic. It took a long time to make, especially in the 80s, when games were being turned around relatively quick on average. The game was open world, one of the earliest examples of open world gameplay. The player could theoretically travel anywhere and tackle the missions of the game however they saw fit. Programming the rippling effect of addressing the missions in different order is part of the reason why it took so long to produce. It was open world, do anything you want, any order you want, and you'd get ripple effects that would happen one minute later or 30 minutes later. There were other games, the Ultima games were open, but things tended to be very compartmentalized. The moral ambiguity of it all made it so interesting, right? Brian Fargo Development of Wasteland was led by Brian Fargo, with the design being done by Ken St. Andre, Michael Stackpole, and Liz Danforth. The post-apocalyptic open-world RPG was heavily inspired by George Miller's Mad Max. Sounds very familiar, right? The game is vital to the development of Fallout, but we'll discuss later why it's not the sole inspiration for the game. Aside from Wasteland, Interplay produced two other games that could be seen as spiritually related to Fallout. One included the point-and-click adaptation of William Gibson's Neuromancer in 1988. The other was Battle Chess, which had particular humorous violence that would find its way into Fallout. Wasteland had two attempted sequels. One was entirely produced by Electronic Arts and titled Fountain of Dreams. Although the game has a passing resemblance to Wasteland, it was developed from the ground up and not built on the same code. Years later, Electronic Arts would say that the game was not officially a sequel to Wasteland. An attempted sequel to Wasteland called Meantime that would be produced by Interplay was cancelled by Fargo after being stuck in development hell. He also realized the graphical fidelity had been surpassed by the Ultima franchise with the release of Ultima 7 in 1992. While Meantime was stuck in development, Interplay released the Bard's Tale construction set in 1991. It allowed players to create their own game in the style of Bard's Tale. This game is fascinating and quite honestly might be part of another video, but for our sake it's important for another reason. Tim Kaine was hired as a freelancer to work on it, and after shipping it, became a full-time employee at Interplay. Tim's first project as a full-time Interplay employee was titled Rags to Riches, The Financial Market Simulation. It's not quite what you would expect from the creator of Fallout, and if you're interested, it's available on my Abandonware to try out. Kane did not have his heart in the project and mentioned in jest during an interview on Dev Game Club, the programmer in the office next to me had done Lord of the Rings, even though he was an economics major and I reread Lord of the Rings every year, we weren't allowed to switch projects, which kind of made me angry. Afterward, Tim was assigned several tasks short of working on a new game. He worked a bit on Stonekeep, though at the time it seems like everyone at the company was involved with Stonekeep at some point. Stonekeep was a first-person RPG which might remind one of King's Field. 
Originally slated to take only nine months, it ultimately took five years and was representative of the problems that would plague Interplay years later. Aside from the sound coding he did on Stonekeep, Tim's other task was to work on installers for new Interplay games. Kane created a reusable installer that would free up his time. Free time, which he used to start building a brand new game engine. Fallout began as a game without a design. It was only an engine that Tim built in his free time. The visuals? Assets that he cobbled together from other Interplay projects. The engine was inspired by two games in particular, XCOM UFO Defense and Crusader No Remorse. XCOM used a turn-based tactical combat system that allowed for a great variety in how you deployed and ordered your alien-busting soldiers around. You could still see the spirit of it in Fallout, even if Fallout's version is simplified in comparison. Crusader No Remorse is an isometric action game with a resolution of 640x480. Having a resolution that high was unusual for the time. After a few months, the engine started to show some progress and Tim was allowed to have some additional staff to assist with building it into a full-fledged game. The first two official members of the team were Jason Taylor, a programmer, and Jason Anderson, an artist. Leonard Boyarski was part of the team unofficially as well, assisting them during after-work pizza idea sessions, along with several other members of the Interplay staff. Leonard Boyarski said about the arrangement, they wouldn't give Tim any resources to make a game, so he started basically sending an email to the entire company saying, Hey, does anyone want to come after work? I'm getting pizzas. Let's talk about some stuff. Tim expanded that it was tricky to get help without being accused of stealing resources. At one point, the executive producer got me into his office and he said, I hear you're using resources here without getting them assigned. And I was like, no, people are working with me after hours, but they could have gone home. So you don't get to tell them what to do here at nine o'clock at night. And the guy went, Okay. Boyarski has stated, though, that after he finished his work on Stonekeep, he was confident that he would be working on whatever Tim Kane was working on next. Even with the newly formed team, there wasn't much to go on. There was a game engine and no concept to really develop the game. During Kane's GDC postmortem, he mentioned that in the early days, Jason Anderson was just designing environmental things like bushes, all of which would eventually be tossed once they decided which direction they were going in. The initial instinct was to create a fantasy RPG. However, the market had been saturated with Dungeons & Dragons titles from companies like Westwood and SSI. They decided against leaning into it, which would be the game's saving grace later in its development cycle. The team started iterating on a new idea. It involved time travel and dinosaurs and magic, and somehow, through the magic of creative process, they winnowed it down to a story of a person who would venture out from an underground vault. Initially, this would be to fend off the last vestiges of civilization against aliens, and then finally, to save the vault from running out of water. Kane and Boyarski have mentioned a load of different inspirations for the team when they began to figure out the concept for the game. The people on the team were media sponges, and a lot of their interests found their way into the game. Computer games, tabletop games, movies, books, graphic novels all contributed. As I mentioned earlier, XCOM and Crusader No Remorse were significant influences. However, Ultima 3 was also a big influence and, well, Wasteland. When the project started, Tim Kane had never played it and was given a copy to play over the weekend. The open world aspect, the setting, everything about Wasteland can be seen influencing Fallout. Tabletop RPGs have always had a genuine connection to computer RPGs. While JRPGs and console-based RPGs tended to drift into being their own thing, computer RPGs hewed much closer to the original. So it's no wonder that they had considerable influence on Fallout. GURPS, developed by Steve Jackson Games, held massive sway over the design. GURPS, or the Generic Universal Role-Playing System, was designed to allow tabletop gamers to create games outside of the typical fantasy setting. According to the GURPS Light rulebook, the basic rule system is designed to emphasize realism. Therefore, it can fit any situation, fantasy or historical, past, present, or future. Aside from GURPS, other touchstones were Wiz War and Gamma World. Gamma World is a fascinating influence. The game is set in a post-apocalyptic nuclear future, much like Fallout. However, Gamma World is a little bit looser with the types of beings that live in this new world. Mad Max and the Road Warrior are the most apparent film inspirations. The Dweller can acquire the gun, the jacket, and the dog in the game as well. Additional film inspirations for the team included A Boy and His Dog. 
The film was based on a Harlan Ellison story of the same name about a boy named Vic and his telepathic dog named Blood. It, like many other inspirations, is set in a post-nuclear future. The concept of the vaults was inspired by the underground society in the story called Down Under. Additional film inspirations would include The Day After, a miniseries that demonstrated the pace at which society would fall apart after a nuclear attack, as well as Forbidden Planet, which is what influenced the retro-futurist look that Leonard Boyarsky designed. Finally, La Jete, a still picture film, had a fair amount of influence on the aesthetic as well. As for the books that inspired them, Canticle for Leibowitz gave them the inspiration for Brotherhood of Steel. I Am Legend spoke to the sense of isolationism the Vault Dweller would feel. On the Beach by Neville Shute was referenced by the team as well. Additionally, Leonard Boyarsky had just read Hard Boiled by Frank Miller and Jeff Darrow, which heavily influenced his art style for the game. Many of their media influences have heavy themes including anti-war and anti-corporation. Tim Kaine mentioned on an episode of Matt Chat that there is a lot of social commentary in Fallout, and it is entirely intentional. Topics like distrust of the government, the military, and corporations are prevalent throughout. Vault Tech was a representation of corporate overreach in everyday lives as they managed to profit off of every phase of the apocalypse. He said, It wouldn't hurt if that game or other games helped raise the consciousness of players who played them just a little bit and made them look at their own governments and their own society just a little more critically. The development cycle was not without roadblocks. The acquisition of the Planescape and Forgotten Realms licenses in late 1994 pushed Fallout to the brink of cancellation. Earlier, we discussed the development of the Fallout concept and how there was an initial inclination toward a fantasy that was quickly abandoned. This critical point is what saved them from their first cancellation. There was no way that Interplay would have let the Fallout team's project continue if it was going to compete for the same genre space. Ultimately, the game was saved by Tim Kaine approaching Brian Fargo and convincing him that Fallout was a project worth continuing. Fargo agreed and decided to give Kane's team their first budget as well. Diablo also presented a unique challenge to the Fallout team. Diablo was developed by Condor Games, which would later become Blizzard North after being acquired by Blizzard. It is a real-time action RPG which plunged the player into the depths of dungeons to face off against waves of enemies for loot. Any similarities between Diablo and Fallout ended at their camera points of view. However, when the game was released, Interplay Management looked at the success of the game and then considered making Fallout mirror Diablo's gameplay. Kane's team needed to check the feasibility of converting Fallout to a real-time system, as well as adding a multiplayer element. Development paused for weeks, and ultimately, the Diablo issue was dropped, however without any recommendation that the Fallout team adopt the game's features. Possibly the most devastating hurdle was the loss of GURPS. As mentioned earlier in the video, GURPS was a big inspiration on Tim and team in creating the game so it was only natural that they designed the RPG system around it. However, during the negotiations for the use of the license, everything fell apart. The story that most often gets told is that Steve Jackson games were not a fan of the way violence was depicted in the game, especially in the opening cinematic, which shows a man being executed by a member of the Brotherhood of Steel. The Vault Boy and the various ways that he would be depicted in death were also a concern for Steve Jackson games. After several weeks of high-level negotiations, it was official. Fallout would not be able to use GURPS. The team was given two weeks to replace it, or once again risk cancellation. Chris Taylor was the second lead designer on the project after the first, Scott Campbell, left at the end of the first year of development. It would be up to him to create a brand new system. He ended up on one that used seven core attributes as opposed to the four primary and four secondaries in GURPS. The seven attributes were strength, perception, endurance, charisma, intelligence, agility, and luck. Special was born. It took Chris a week to create the special system, and it took another week for Tim to implement it into the game. The whole issue with GURPS was successfully sidestepped in a matter of weeks. There were plenty of loose ends for the team to flesh out before the game could be released. Things like perks were added upon a request from Brian Fargo. He had taken the game home one weekend and made a note about how there should be more granted to the player when they leveled up. It took all of two days to conceptualize and implement them. Similarly, companions were added very late in the development cycle. They were added through scripting and not into the game engine itself. 
This made bug testing them particularly tricky, and as anyone who has given Ian a machine gun knows, they had plenty of kinks that needed to be worked out. Quests were balanced during the final push of the game. All mainline quests had to be beaten in one of three ways, combat, stealth, or charisma, to represent the three primary character builds in the game. While side quests did not necessarily have all three solves, the main storyline having all three was a requirement. Speaking of quests, one that split the team in half was whether to include a timer on the main journey. It also ended up dividing the fans of the game as well. The main quest of Fallout involved the player leaving their vault to find a water chip that will prevent the vault from running dry. This quest had a countdown timer, and when it hit zero, it was game over. Granted, there were ways to extend the timer by sending shipments of water to the vault and eventually finding the chip would disable it altogether. However, being set against that timer shortchanged players from the sense of open exploration that they were going for. Tim Kaine years later regretted the mechanic and said that were he to do it all over, he wouldn't have any time mission mechanics. Probably the most significant change that happened as development approached the finish line was a change of name. See, the game wasn't called Fallout for most of its production, it was called Vault 13. Heck, even before that, it was being created under the guise of being a direct sequel to Wasteland. Electronic Arts, though, would not give the rights to the Wasteland IP over to Interplay, and it became its own thing. But back to Vault 13. The marketing department at Interplay did not believe that the title of the game really told players what the game was about. There were many other names suggested, including the straightforward post-nuclear role-playing game. Brian Fargo suggested the name Fallout, and after some deliberation, it stuck. Officially, the game's name became the combination of Fargo's suggestion and marketing's, Fallout, a post-nuclear role-playing game. The opening cinematic would be scored with a song by the Ink Spots, who were the favorite band of Tim Kaine's grandfather. He felt that they had the perfect sound to capture the pre-war era of Fallout. Initially, they were trying to get the song, I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire, but found that it would cost too much money to license. They settled on the song Maybe, which after listening to, they felt fit the game much better thematically. Set the World on Fire would be later used by Bethesda in Fallout 3. By the time the game shipped, the team had grown from a few members at its start to upwards of 30. Several were supplied by Fergus Urquhart's recently formed Black Isle Studios. That number is even higher when you consider all the QA people that worked on the game. Fallout was released on September 30th, 1997 and would go on to sell over 100,000 copies by the end of the year. Interplay moved quickly, greenlighting a sequel, and did its best to keep the same team together. However, for Tim Kaine, Jason Anderson, and Leonard Boyarsky, it didn't feel quite the same. The original Fallout was a labor of love for them, something that they fought and clawed through several instances of near cancellation. And now, it was being fast-tracked to become Interplay's next big franchise, and it seemed like they were losing part of what made it unique to them. Not long after, the three of them left Interplay to found their own company, Troika. Fallout 2 would be released exactly one year later, on September 30th, 1998. The fall of Interplay and the transition of the Fallout franchise from CRPG Classic to a worldwide phenomenon under Bethesda's guidance is another video altogether. In this episode, I just wanted to talk about one game that was made from pizza parties and grit. Many of the leading creators of Fallout are still producing today. After Troika shuttered, Kane, Boyarsky, and Anderson went their separate ways. Leonard worked for Blizzard for nearly 10 years and was the lead world designer for Diablo 3. Kane worked at Carbine Studios. Eventually, though, Boyarsky and Kane found themselves together again at Obsidian Entertainment, a company fully staffed with former Interplay and Black Isle employees. In 2018, it was announced that they were co-directing a game together, titled The Outer Worlds. Anyway, that's all for me today. My sources will be listed in the description below, and if you have any comments, you can leave them here or reach out to me on Twitter, at The Arcadeologist. Take care.